And the last uh, f- few weeks, we've been looking at Reality Check 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So Reality Check 1 really was all about prayer, to follow Christ. There is a cost, there is a sacrifice in terms of being those who actually give ourselves to prayer. We looked at Reality Check 2, which was about our wallets, the rich young ruler. To follow Christ means there is a bit of a sacrifice that we are to those that give in to the things of God. Reality Check 3 was about it not being about us. Do you remember that one? And about pride and uh, at the, the cost of laying down our own agenda. And also, uh, week four was uh, the whole thing of mission, the temple, uh, the fact that every person matters. And then fifthly, uh, we had Reality Check 5, which was about the fact that we cannot control everything. We can't be like the Sadducees who are control freaks. So basically, the point is this, is that to follow Christ isn't easy. It's not easy. It's not it doesn't mean a life of comfort. It doesn't mean a life of, uh, of everything being hunky-dory. But you could be forgiven if you've been here and you've been thinking, okay, Tom, surely if I put into place those, those five things that you've said, surely if I'm willing to pay the price for those five things, then surely now, today, can be a nice one. Surely today can be <laughs> that following Jesus, there's going to be some easy element to it. There's going to be some kind of wonderful, glorious, peaceful kind of deal that now we can look at today. I'm sorry, guys. Mark 13, if you know it, is anything but. Reality Check 6 today, I've just called this. It's going to get hairy. Okay? Things are going to get hairy. I don't mean as in physically. I mean as in uh, we're going to see here that even if you do put all those things into place, that you're willing to follow Christ in those ways, listen up. Even then, to follow Christ means you're actually following him into a life of trouble. Into a life of trouble. Glorious trouble, because he's with you, but trouble nonetheless. And we're going to see here today, Jesus say that. And Jesus is going to give us a loving warning today, yet again. A loving warning. But you know, for warnings to have effect, they need to have, secondly, people who respond to the warning. That's an obvious point, but it's not enough for someone just to issue a warning. You need to also respond. You know, the captain of the Titanic apparently had six separate radio in uh, radio in uh, warn- warnings from the guys who you know were I don't know back in back, back at land saying, "Hey, watch out! There's icebergs up ahead." Six times they warned him, and six times he went, "It's fine. She's un- she's unsinkable." Man, we-, we have to be those that respond. Amen. We have to be those that actually hear the warnings and actually go, we don't want to be like the, the captain of the Titanic. Jesus lovingly here warns us with a fatherly pastoral heart that to follow him means that actually your life will have trouble. Things will get hairy, but you'll be with him. And that infinitely trumps even those momentary troubles that come our way. So let's read then. First of all, we're going to work through um, some of this chapter, not all of it. It's... Um, and just to say, it's one of those chapters where there is quite a lot of uh, full-on language, vivid imagery. You have to work a little bit to keep up with it. But you know, golden rule with the Bible, even those chapters which can sometimes seem most, what? Work hard because there's gold in them. Okay, so let's read from verse 1, chapter 13. And as he came out of the temple, so once again the temple, big theme, one of his disciples said to him, look teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Okay, just just to say, right now, Jesus is giving them a reality check, and you can imagine they'll probably be on the surface of it smiling like, right? And inside be thinking, oh my goodness. Imagine you go for a stroll with someone, and as you walk past the Houses of Parliament, they go, yeah, it's all going to come down. It's going to blow up. Inside, you'd be thinking, what on earth? Who is this person? It's that kind of moment. So what does Jesus say? Here we see in verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, probably trying to be relaxed, but actually thinking, what on earth is going on? Tell us, Jesus, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars, rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. 
but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when, you bring, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will deliver brother over to death. The father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. I think we need to pray. Lord, we come before your word with a real seriousness. That all of it is perfect. That you didn't misspeak anything that we love the positive sugary bits as it were but these bits which are real and raw and gritty lord we want to humbly come before you say spirit of god please teach us change us shape us in jesus name amen so i want to look at three different steps here first of all the step is of of what's actually just going to happen and i've called it trouble is our trademark (laughs) Trouble is our trademark. We're just going to spend a few moments looking at actually just the reality of what Jesus is saying. But then secondly, which comes out of that first question is then, well, what should our response be? Which I've summarized simply as, it's about strength more than safety. It's about strength, and I'll show what I mean by that in a moment. But then thirdly, we're going to finish by looking at the question then, well, how on earth earth can we be like that? If trouble's coming but our response needs to be about strength rather than safety. How can we be those who are strong under trouble? And we're going to look at the fact that there is a power that we see here for the impossible. All right, so that's where we're going. First of all, then, we see here what I've called trouble is our trademark. We see here, and what we have to understand is in these first few verses, the first 13 verses, Jesus here, he describes what I've entitled trouble with a small t. Not that the trouble is insignificant or easy, but that it is specific and it is localized. He is predicting here that in the next 40 years from the time of him speaking, from AD 30 to AD 70, these men listening to him will experience localized and specific trouble. I.e., ultimately, as we see in the book of Acts, yes, there'll be great growth, but also there'll be great persecution. And ultimately, the temple in AD 70 will come down. He's just saying there's going to be a specific and localized trouble. Now, in a moment, we're going to look at some verses that come after this, which are trouble capital T. Trouble that he then flows into prophesying about, which will, as it were, not just be specific and local, but will be global and general. But let's just spend a moment, first of all, just looking at what he's saying here. He's saying this. He's saying, listen, to follow me means that there will be specific backlash as a result of it. Now, what's really interesting is that these guys who are listening to him in the coming years, they form the leadership of the first megachurch. Yeah? Megachurch, city church, Jerusalem. Uh, We see later on, one of them, he he speaks a very normal sermon, and 3,000 people respond. Hey, big tick. We we all want that, right? That sounds amazing. We're going to see these guys listening to him are are in leadership of the first ever megachurch. But what we're going to see is this, is that he's saying, yes, but with growth, with excitement things, with like that everything agenda where we see people influencing culture because they get changed, they get saved, as well as that, alongside that, you will see increasing hostility, increasing persecution, increasing people who hate Jesus. It's both, is what he's saying. It's not just growth, it's not just alpha causes bursting at the seams, it's also going to be trouble as people respond to the increasing, unmissable church of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem and here in East Kent. That's what he's saying. There's trouble going to come. And what he's saying is, it's okay. Trouble is your trademark. You see, the, the the fact is this, is that all throughout the New Testament, you see this recurring kind of dynamic. Acts chapter 1 to 7 is all about growth. Acts chapter 8, persecution occurs. It's all about growth, and then finally, The backlash occurs in Acts chapter 8. Go and read it. And persecution comes. And Jesus is warning them. Listen, it's all about expectations. Say expectations. In Whitstable, say expectations. Thank you. It's about expectations. When you get married, I got married seven years ago, I think. One of the biggest learning curves was, yeah, seven years ago, um, (laughs) was expectations. Oh, my expectation of a day off is this. I do absolutely nothing. 
your expectation is a little different, Dynamo Josie says. My expectation of a holiday is I do absolutely nothing. I'm very lazy. Josie's is a little different. Expectations are huge. Listen, Jesus lovingly is getting their expectations right. Do you understand that? He's saying, you're going to see amazing things happen. But you're also going to see trouble with a small t. Specific, localized, and response to a growing church. That's what you're going to see. Acts chapter 17 talks about the response of the leaders, some leaders in a place called Thessalonica, and they're describing the Christians are coming. Do you know how they describe them? I love this. Those troublemakers, says in the NIV. Those troublemakers who have turned the world upside down. That is how the early Christians were known. We've heard about them. They're troublemakers, glorious troublemakers. I love that. That is why ultimately Jesus Christ was taken to the cross, because he was a glorious troublemaker. Do you understand that? That is... That is who we are called to be. But the slight challenge is this. Tom Wright, who's an amazing bishop, writer, many of us read his stuff, this week tweet, tweeted, he said this, when Paul went to a city, he caused riots. When I go to a city, we drink tea. That is scarily true, isn't it? Why did, why did that occur? It was because Paul understood a dynamic, perhaps, that we have to learn to discover here today. These things are going to get hairy. <laughs> Trouble is our trademark. It's, it's not something that's something wrong. Actually, often it's a sign that things are right. We, many of us in this room, so want to know the approval of others that even a frown from someone at work can put us off talking about Christ. You know, an experience where you're friendly with someone and then you just go for it and you try and communicate something about God or the church and it goes from friendly to frosty. I hate that. But you know what? It's biblical. That's what he's saying here. You cannot be a people who actually authentically are my people without both yes seeing people say, you're the fragrance of life, it says in Corinthians. And other people going, you are the fragrance of death. Some of us aren't the fragrance of anything. That's what Tom Wright's getting at. That's what he's getting at. That is what Paul here, not Paul, Jesus rather, is saying is going to be the normal course of the church. Verse 13, you will be hated by all. Was that just for them? Was it just this one-off thing that they were going to live in a really bad time and we'll, we'll be different? No, I don't think it's that at all. You'll be hated by all. Brother against brother. Father against son. That is harsh. Jesus is saying, if you follow me, there'll be times where your values will clash with your parents. Yeah, you know, you're going to get baptized even though you were confirmed and they're going to react badly. And do you know what? That's biblical. For some of you, 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 you will not offend your parents because you would rather potentially offend God. And he's saying, listen, trouble is not a sign that everything's wrong. Trouble when you're obeying Christ is a sign that actually you're following me. Do you see that? The family tie is a beautiful thing. I love it. But don't let it so overpower your allegiance to Christ. Christ repeatedly says, You must let me be Lord of your life. You must do that. It's interesting, isn't it? Just the last few weeks, Roman Catholic priest, I can't remember his name, like a lone wolf standing up in the press saying, I do believe homosexual marriage breaks the heart of God. And I don't know if you saw Question Time, I was told it was absolutely just really, really not receiving that well. It's interesting, just in the press recently, the Secular Society tried to take a Devonshire County council to court. Why? Because they opened their meeting with prayers. 171,000 Christians will die this year because of their faith. They could easily not be martyred. All they'd have to do is just not stand up for Jesus. That's all they'd have to do. That's all they'd have to do. Just keep quiet. Just not upset. Then they wouldn't be martyred. Just say that Jesus isn't really that important. Just keep quiet. Most of those wouldn't be martyred because of it, but they will not do that because they've understood something. I feel God wants to help us on this. I think God is promising us great expansion and growth, but I believe he's also saying, reality check. Things will get hairy. There will be division. There will be people who try and cause division. There will be attempts for people to come and try and lead astray. It says here, doesn't it? It says in verse 9, you'll be delivered over to councils. Our experience with the council so far has been brilliant, but it may not stay that way. And that may be God's plan. It's very biblical. And it says division in families. Some of you, it's going to be really costly. 
to really follow Christ. It is going to be that. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to patronize you. It's just what the Bible says. It's heartbreaking. But it actually, ultimately, Jesus, in his loving pastoral care here, he doesn't want them to be unprepared. He wants to prepare them. Expectations. If your expectations are that this is just going to be like a sugary thing, woo, great, I'm a Christian, nice, neat. It's not like, it's messy, it's painful, it's difficult, it's real, it's gritty. That's what he's saying. But also, then we see he moves on to then prophesy about trouble, capital C, in verse 14. When you see the abomination of desolation, standing where he ought not to, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, enter his house, or take anything out. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to, to take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation, trouble, as it has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. Christ for false Christ, false prophets will arise, perform signs, signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on your guard, and I have told you all things beforehand. Now this is a little bit of one of those, what? Tribulation, this guy, abomination of the what? Desolation. Basically, this is what's called a double referent, a double prediction. He's predicting the end of the temple. In AD 70, the Roman emperor Titus, uh, he brought down the destruction of the temple the abomination. That's part one of it being fulfilled. But all the commentators agree, it's like also Jesus is predicting that will be like a picture. The difficulty and the strife and the awful things that happen in AD 70 in Jerusalem will be like a picture of an end time tribulation or trouble that Christians will face that will be global and it will be general. It won't be escapable. That's what he's doing. He's, he's predicting that and he's saying, for in those days there'll be such tribulation has not been from the beginning. He's saying, look, I just want to be real with you. I want to have a reality check. I don't want to pretend everything's going to be easy. It won't. There will be major trouble, capital T, before the return of, my, of myself. That's what Jesus is saying. I will come back. But before that, there will be major, major tribulation, major persecution, major difficulties, is what he's saying here. So you're probably sitting here thinking, blimey. Oh, great. But why, Tom? And the reason why is this, is that the gospel itself, in its very essence, is confrontational. It's good news, but it's confrontational. The gospel itself effectively says this, I was wrong. What's the gospel? It means you say, oh, well, yeah, when I thought I was the center, and I thought God wasn't real, I was wrong. People who get defensive when they're lovingly, constructively criticized, I sometimes think the whole point of being a Christian is, is admitting you got it wrong. And that's, what he, and that's the reality, is, but that's confrontational. When I was chatting with my neighbor recently, and he at first was talking about some religious people in the street saying, they are just hypocrites. And I have to say, in large measure, I kind of agreed. I didn't say that, but I was thinking, yeah, he's probably right. But then I had to say to him, yeah, but Ian, you're a hypocrite, and I'm a hypocrite. The Bible says it's not just them, it's all of us. Now, at that moment, it went from being a friendly banter to being somewhat frosty. But it's true. You see, suddenly, I, one minute I was like, yeah, this guy's good. And then suddenly I was saying, yeah, but it's not just them. They're just maybe a little more obvious. The, the gospel takes us from friendly to frosty. It's unpleasant. It's difficult, isn't it? I've got to live next to this guy maybe for like decades. <laughs> and actually, we're getting on all right, but it was frosty in the moment is what I'm saying. The gospel itself, but then even the gospel outworked. The more that you look at the gospel, the more that you carry on the Christian faith, maybe it's just me, but the more I see of a God who is not just powerful, but who's moral. That's the thing the world hates. It's not that he's powerful, it's that he's moral. It's that he loves some things and he hates others. Now, the more that you say, Lord, I want to live to please you, love the things you love, hate the things you hate, that will be very evident that you are someone who is not in the same team that you were. Your values are different to the world around us. It's like if you support Manchester United and then you find yourself in the Manchester City end of the football thing, arena, whatever it's called. You know what I mean? In the crowd of football supporters who are opposite to you is what I'm saying. You realize that you're different. Christians have a different value system. And yes, we look for the men and women of peace, as Jesus said, but even in our best efforts to do that, he's saying there will be trouble. But this sounds all negative, doesn't it? 
It sounds very negative, and all this pain that I'm predicting and Jesus predicting, you're thinking, oh, great. But this is where I want to lift your gaze. Listen, verse 8 is massive for us because he says this. These are the, be- but the beginnings of birth pains. The more you dwell on that verse, the more the whole thing links together. Because birth pains are painful, I'm told. <laughs> they are painful, but they are not a sign that something's wrong. They are a sign that something good is happening and something glorious is going to come. Do you see that? He's saying, all these things I'm predicting, all this trouble, this stuff, it's painful, but it's not a sign that something is wrong. It's a sign that something very, very good is going to come. Ultimately, the return of Jesus Christ and the restoring of all things to be new. But even the birthing of real, authentic church. Churches get born through this stuff. Real, robust Christianity gets gets born through this. Through the birth pains of difficult trouble and persecution and strife is what he's saying. But it doesn't mean it's going to be soon. Josie, between her waters breaking and the birth pains occurring and little Daisy being born, our firstborn, it was no less than 48 hours. That's a long time, okay, to have birth pains. Some of you maybe had longer. But believe me, it went on. So he's not saying even that Christ is going to return soon. In fact, he says, don't try and work it out time-wise. That's not the deal. The deal is this. There's going to be pain, but it's a kind of good pain because something good is going to happen. Do you understand that? That's what he's saying. He's saying, yes, it's not pleasant, but it's very key. But we sit there and go, okay, so, so what do we do then? Second point. What do we do? We, we hear that trouble is our trademark. It's going to come. And Jesus gives us this amazing actual positive vision of this kind of pain. What do we do? Because anyone, particularly first-time dads, you know you're terrified. She's week 39. Have we done everything? And you've done all the preparation. Maybe you told your neighbors, got them on red alert. You told your parents. But there is also the ultimate issue of the bag. The bag. Yes, some of you have it. You know what? The bag in all the magazines is like, have you got the bag? The bag ready with 15 you know, toothbrushes and 45 flannels and 65 bars of soap. Have you got the bag ready? And every day you check, is the bag ready? It's ready. Okay, we can go to bed now. Is it, are you sure it's ready, Tom? Yes, it's ready. The bag is ready, my love, with everything. So that when it occurs, the bag is ready. And Jesus here, he gives us a way to get ready for it. He didn't say, yeah, it's going to happen. So good luck. Bye. He gives us, actually, if you look through the whole chapter, 19 imperatives. Now, fear not. We're not going to look at them all because you can condense them right down to just a few. An imperative is a thing to do. It's just a thing to do. It means a bag to pack. What? How do we get ready for this trouble that's going to come? What bag do we pack? He gives us 19 imperatives. And this is key because if you look in the book of uh, 2 Peter, which I think we've got the scripture, it says this incredible promise. It says this, Knowing that the heavens will pass away with a roar, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are going to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? Look at that word, hastening. You and I, if we get our bags packed well, if we do the things that Jesus tells us to do when trouble comes, we can actually hasten the day of the Lord. If we live lives that aren't all just panicking and freaking out, but are actually in the way that he gives us here for point two, we can actually hasten the day of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I find that amazing. I can't even understand it, but it's true. And so he gives us two things to avoid. Don't put those in the bag. And then a few things to pursue. First two things to avoid, make sure those aren't in your life when trouble comes, is first of all, anxiety. He says it repeatedly in different ways. Don't be alarmed. Don't be anxious. Don't be scared. Don't be anxious. I love this because all of you right now are feeling freaked out after part one. You're like, oh, and he just knows it. He says, first of all, take a breath with a smile on his face. I felt God say to us in the coming weeks, months, and years for us as a church, our biggest, our biggest focus is to courage. I think it's about courage. As we go into a multi-million pound building project, as we go into multi-site church, as we look to see God expand all that he's doing here, I find him just say, it's about courage. It's about faith. It's about keeping your eye on what you're called by God to do and not letting things rob you of that. Fear can rob a church of what God wants for it. 
Many Christians are the biggest panickers on planet Earth. You're not allowed to be, all right? Sorry, the Bible says it. You're not allowed to panic. And I love it because Jesus wouldn't tell you to do something if you weren't able to do it. That's a promise, isn't it? He wouldn't say, don't be alarmed if you are unable to not be alarmed. And we often think that, don't we? Well, I'm just a worry box. I'm sorry, it's just who I am. No, you're not. If you know Jesus, you are a brand new creation in God. And he wants to fill you with an amazing power to not be anxious. Avoid anxiety, he says. Secondly, he says, avoid being led astray. So first is an attitude, second is an action. Don't be led astray. And repeatedly in this passage, he talks about men who will try and lead you astray. Gifted leaders, anointed leaders, who can really preach and lead, who are inspirational. But you know what? Their character is rotten, and they want to lead you astray. And when you're facing trouble, you're more vulnerable at times to being led astray. And at times, I at times talk to Christians who never read, who never read the Bible, who are just, just so vulnerable to the next passing thing, maybe from America or someone else. Just, oh, really? have you heard? Wow. And I'm like, yeah, there's gifting. But that's, that doesn't mean that there's character. Don't be led astray. Recent example, very obvious, very talented, gifted speaker who's basically saying that there's no real hell anymore. Not in the form that classic Orthodox Christianity would say. People are swallowing it because he's cool. Don't be a wally. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't be led astray. Don't put that in your bag, all right? Don't be led astray. Don't be anxious. But, sec- but secondly, he gives us a few things to pursue, to put in. Are you ready for this? First of all, he says it here, be on guard. So don't have an anxious, an, an, an anxious attitude. Have an, an a, a attitude that is vigilant, that is on guard. Guard your heart with all vigilance, Proverbs says. Above everything, guard it. Be like, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, you're old or young, be uh, on guard at guarding your heart and guarding your mind is what he's saying. Be on guard, particularly with, with, with the fact that Christ will return at any moment. It says like a thief in the night, he will literally return. William Lane, the commentator says, because the moment of return is unknowable, unceasing vigilance is imperative. Is that like you? Honestly, is it like me? Be on guard is what he says. He then says three actions. Preach, pray, and press on. Preach, pray, and press on. He says, first of all, preach, verse 10. What do we do when trouble comes? You preach. I love verse 10. The gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. In the midst of trouble coming in, we must stay a proclaiming people. Proclaim, preach. It means herald. James MacDonald, the American preacher, says, nowadays, preaching the gospel is rare. You find sharing. Let's have a conversation about the gospel with people. It's all very cool. You preach it. You unashamedly preach it. It doesn't mean you scream at people, although I am doing that, of course. But what it means is, it means there's a, there's a boldness. There is a proclamation. There is a deep down confidence, actually. We don't try and woo people. Well, you proclaim the gospel. Is it? it must be proclaimed. The gospel. What's the gospel? It's the good news that only Jesus is the one who can deliver you from trouble ultimately. He has defeated sin. He has defeated death. He has proved it. He has risen in glory and he wants to give you a chance to know him if you don't know him. That's the gospel. And you proclaim it. And it's not about having eloquent words. You can be a mother who never stands on here and you're just a a mum who actually mainly proclaims your gospel to your children or to your neighbours or to your workmates. We're all called to be proclaimers. It's not about standing here. I remember probably the decisive moment um, when I was an atheist. I was at Kent University walking outside of a bar, and there was a girl I vaguely knew, and I've told the story loads, but I said, oh, hi, Susie. What have you been doing? Having a beer? And she just went, no, I've been praying. And it wasn't just the fact that she said praying. It was the way she said it. She preached it. There was like a, oh. She said it boldly. She didn't scream it. She just said, I've been praying. Hmm. The feel of it. It was lovingly challenging. And I was like, ooh, I say. Do you know what? The, the moment went from friendly to frosty. And I said, don't you try and convert me. 
I probably know more than you do in my arrogance, but a seed was sown and the rest is history. It's not about having great style. It's about proclaiming it in a way that is real. All the nations must hear it. That's why we're church planting into Lille. Get ready for that. Rog and George and others. That's why we're believing God for a church plant in Helsinki. And many of you, are going to, God's going to call to other places. Because it's about the nations. It's about proclaiming it not just in Canterbury or Whitstable or even Kent or the UK. To the nations. God is wanting his church to be international in its scope. Proclaiming, not whispering, proclaiming the gospel. But then he also says in verses 18 and 34, you've got to pray. 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 It's coming back every week, isn't it? Pray, 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 pray. And guess what? Pray. William Spurgeon said, anything, even the worst trouble that comes your way, anything that causes you to pray is a blessing. Think about that. That's profound. Anything. You've lost your job. Okay. Or you split up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Or your housemates are a nightmare. Or your mum and dad is really, really sick. Or whatever it might be, anything, any trouble that God allows, the Bible says that causes you to pray is a blessing, ultimately. Because prayer is so powerful. D.L. Moody, one of the greatest preachers ever, who would have agreed with my last point, he said this, I would rather be able to pray than to preach. Because, you see, he said, Jesus never actually taught his disciples in the Scriptures how to preach, but he taught them how to pray. He wasn't diminishing preaching. He was just saying, if anything, if I had to choose, I'd be the world's best prayer. We have to be a people who pray. And pray, as I've said here, about being strong more than safety. I realized just this last couple of weeks that every day when Josie takes Daisy, Lily, and Poppy, or Daisy and Lily, to school and nursery along the Ashford Road. I hate that road. It's so scary. And I pray, God, keep them safe. That's a good prayer. But if I God say to me, you can't just stop at safety. Pray for their souls. Because there will come a time when they will die. There will come a time. I pray it's way after I've gone. But my biggest prayer needs, Lord, let them know you and let them stay strong in you. I can't just pray for safety. As much as I adore them, God said, you must pray for their souls and pray that they will be strong when trouble comes. And then we press on. We press on. He says, those who endure to the end. You must develop an enduring spirit is what he says. Someone famously said, go the extra mile. It's guaranteed to be not very busy there. Because few people go the extra mile. Keep pushing on is what he says. Keep going. Keep going. J.C. Ryle, a guy who lived in the 1900s, an amazing guy. He knew about this. It was said of him, he was a man of granite with the heart of a child. He was a man who, who at 29, he got married. In, in his early 20s, he got married. He had five kids. He was leading of a church, and his wife died at age 29. Wife died. Five kids, busy church. He, he kept on going, believing God, remarried. A few years later, she then died. By this point, I think he had two more kids. And he, he was just pouring himself into his kids, going on, enduring, keeping on going, keeping on going. And as in those days, the, the Church of England in those days was rife with liberalism, I just disregarding the Bible. And he was like a lone wolf, not a lone wolf, he was like a lone voice who believed in the Bible, who believed it was true. And the, 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 the persecution he experienced, the, the ridicule, the aggression against him was unbelievable. But it was, he said, I made up my mind to not give a jot what people said about me, but only live to please my Lord. A man of granite with a heart of a child. That's what I want to be like. Don't you want to be like that? That's what he's describing. If we're going to be part of a growing church that sees growth, we will see trouble coming. But at the same time, at the same time, there will be trouble that comes, but it's not to, to, to cause us to be anxious. It's not to cause us to freak out. It's actually, it's actually inevitable. Trouble is our trademark. And when that occurs, the issue is not safety. It's not retrieval. It's not hibernation. It's not holding on. It's actually staying strong. It's preaching. It's praying. It's pressing on in the things of God. So right now, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, I want to be like the granite man, but how do I do that? 
And this is the wonderful thing, because if we stopped here, we could be in danger of preaching a sermon like most of the religions in the world, which is try hard. Is it about trying hard? It's not. It's about trusting him. You see, what we find here, we see two glorious ways that actually he's real about the trouble, he's honest about how we need to respond in it, but then he gives us the power for the impossible. First of all, we see here in verse um, 11. Verse 11, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. He's saying here, how do you do this? How, how do you actually be someone when people respond badly and they, and they don't respond well when you talk about Christ and you try and push forward? How do we respond? He's saying this, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. He will be with you in those times in a heightened way. Matthew 28, when Jesus gave us the Great Commission, he says, go, make disciples, and I will be with you. Now, clearly, he's always with us. But many commentators say it's like a hint that maybe, just maybe, in those radical moments of mission, there's an extra sort of sense of his nearness. And Jesus is certainly saying that here, isn't he? You see, many of us as Christians, when we think about knowing the nearness of God, we say, let's have another prayer meeting. And I love prayer meetings. Amen. I love prayer meetings. But he's also saying, actually, radical mission, radical mission, where you feel very, very vulnerable, is where my presence will come upon you and I will give you words that you think, how is this happening? It's not always just about gathering to pray, although that is massive. He's saying, for some of you, many of you, many of you, some of you here today, you love God and you do read the word and you do most of the stuff, but there's something missing. And it's because you're not actually on mission for some of you. You're not actually in the place where you're vulnerably stepping out where it could go wrong. (laughs) Because Jesus says in those moments, as you step out, scary as it is, I promise the Holy Spirit. That is the part, that is the ingredient that sometimes we miss because we're so, so nervous about facing disapproval. God today wants to lift us and say, listen, If you'll step out, I promise you, I'll step out with you. I'll give you power to overcome anxiety. Power to not be led astray. Power to be on guard. Power to preach. Power to pray. Power to press on. Francis Chan tells the incredible true story of some missionaries who were captured in North Korea. And they were facing certain death, 20 of them. But in their little cell, as they were facing death, They felt the deep presence of the Lord. And so one by one, they actually started, this is true, arguing about who would die first. The first said, I'm a pastor, let me die first. The other one said, no way, I'm the leader of the group, let me die first. And so one by one, they were let out. And they were killed. First one, executed. Second one, third one. Miraculously, the last 17 were spared. And they went back and they made it back to South Korea. And over the coming weeks and months, one by one by one, they met with the leader of the group and they all individually said the same thing to him. He said, they said, as crazy as this sounds, although it's great being back in South Korea, I actually miss being in that cell because the presence of the Lord was so real and tangible and strong. That is incredible. That's the promise that if we will be faithful, We may never end up in a dramatic situation quite of that extreme. We may do, some of us. The presence of the Spirit in the moment. But we must finish by also saying a second incredible promise we see here. A second incredible promise in verse 24. In those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then... Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send out angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Friends, it's not just about knowing the Spirit in the moment. Forgive me for my alliteration, but it's also about knowing the Son in that moment. That great moment that every Christian should be living for. Because of American preachers who in many ways have have made the second coming of Christ into a joke. 
the way they've done it. We never talk about it, do we? We never talk about it. And yet, you know, 27 books in the New Testament, 24 of them talk about the second coming. 24 of them. There are 260 verses in total in the New Testament, and there are over 300 references to the second coming of Christ. It is massive throughout the New Testament that Jesus, who went to the cross for your sin and for my sin, who died in your place with your sin on him, but then three days later was gloriously raised to life, and said, one day I shall return. The Son of Man shall come in glory. Throughout this whole book of Mark, Jesus has been saying, it's, don't think about glory. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. And finally now we see here, he lifts our view to that great day when the trumpet will sound and Jesus Christ will return. And all the people who've been pretending, oh, I'm the Messiah, they will be exposed as the false things that they are. No one will be able to We'll be able to doubt it. He uses his imagery here. The sun will be dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will fall. What is he saying here? Things that in this time, when this was written, and even nowadays, that the world sees as all-powerful, like stars. Do you know, many would say that horoscopes are the biggest reason why things like the sun and other uh, newspapers sell like they do. People really believe with all their heart that the stars can tell us what the future is going to be, that there's power. And Jesus here says, everything that this world think is powerful, there'll be like a cosmic collapse. And yet rising up in glorious, indestructible power will be the Son of Man riding on clouds of glory. Friends, he will then usher in the, the new age, is what it's saying. And I love this. He says he will gather his elect. Throughout the Old Testament and the New, scattering is a sign of things going wrong. A sign of God's displeasure. I scatter you. And he says, there will be a time of gathering. That's why the gathered church is that beginnings. That begin Gather. He doesn't say gather the religious. He doesn't say gather those who have done really well and tried to do all the right things. His elect. Do you feel the warmth? The warmth. His chosen ones. In an election. At that time. Who is in power? It's the one doing the choosing. It's the people. They have the power. And he's saying here, he is the one that chooses. He elects. It's amazing. It's not because of anything you or I have ever done. If you're not a Christian here today, and you think being a Christian is about somehow earning your way to heaven, this screams, no. It's about his grace. It's about his mercy. Do you feel the fact, I will gather my, I will gather my sons, my daughters. I will gather them. And then we shall begin the new age. Then we should begin the new age. This whole chapter is saying, don't put your hope in this world. Don't put your hope in this world, as great as it is. Do not put your hope in this world. Put your hope in the world to come. Live for that world, is what he's saying. Put your investments in there. Your time, your energy, your money. Put, focus it in there. Because that is the one true place. This brief life we have here, will be like the blink of an eye. John chapter 5 says this about this day. At the voice of Christ, the dead will rise out of their tombs. JFK will rise out of his tomb and he will give an account to Jesus, the Son of Man. Amy Winehouse will rise out of her tomb and give an account to Jesus Christ. Whitney Houston will rise out of her tomb and give an account to Jesus Christ. This is what it's saying. It's saying if you don't know Christ, this is your moment to say that sounds quite scary. And you might think, how can I possibly believe this, Tom? And I don't blame you if you think this sounds a bit mad. But let me ask you this one question. If Jesus Christ really did ri rise from the dead, as the Bible tells us, and then he appeared to hundreds, if he really did defeat death, then actually him returning... It's not actually impossible to believe at all. So if you're not a Christian here today, my one huge appeal to you would be look into the resurrection of Jesus. Because that, if someone really has died and come back from the dead, that is the most important thing we could ever know about. And it's not just an important fact. It is the guarantee of what he's saying now. It is the guarantee. He's saying, I've defeated sin and death. And I have given you a time of grace, O world, 
where you can still respond. You can say, say, Lord, I know I'm not perfect and you are and I need to get right with you. Lord, on that day, let it be a day of great celebration for me. Let it not be a day where I face you and I try and give you my best works and we know they won't be good enough. Let it be a day where you say, I look at my son's goodness at the cross and I credit your account with all of his obedience.